we've done some work, not seaweed, but uh, bromoform-based synthetic compounds. So it basically acts exactly as, uh, as seaweed. And what we've, seen, what we've seen there was a reduction up to 90%, more than 90% reduction in, in emissions. And uh, we haven't seen any, uh, any kind of um, effect in terms of the, the growth. This is in beef cattle. Uh, growth or or, or, or any, any other uh, metric. So um, keeping the same level of productivity, uh, who knows, maybe even better, um, uh, then we see quite a quite substantial reduction in emissions. So for farmers, this means that there's a practical way to make a big climate impact without undermining productivity. And we hope that actually increases uh, productivity. We need to do more work for a longer period of time with more animals to be able to say definit definitively that there is a, a productivity gain here as well. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us um, for this edition of the Dairy Health Black Belt podcast sponsored by Wisenetics. Um, I'm Craig McConnell. I am uh, the head of Vet Med Extension and the continuing education here at Washington State University's College of Vet Med. And it is my distinct honor today to welcome Dr. Ermias Kabrab, who is a professor and the Associate Dean of Global Engagement at the University of California Davis's College of Ag and Environmental Sciences. He's also the director of the UC Davis World Food Center. He's given TED Talks on what seaweed and cow burps have to do with climate change. He's been on NPR, and now we're lucky enough to have Dr. Kabrab on the Dairy Health Black Belt podcast. So welcome, Dr. Kabrab. It's such an honor to have you here today. And first of all, tell me if I'm saying your last name correctly. Yes. So well, uh, thank you very much for, for having me. Yes. Uh, um, uh, that, that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> it's close enough. All right. Good. So today we're going to touch on methane in, uh, inhibitors and additives. And so let's just jump right into the basics. Um, first question I have is, why is methane from cattle such an important issue when we talk about climate change? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Um, methane is really a, a, quite a powerful greenhouse gas. And uh, one thing unique about methane is that it doesn't stay in the atmosphere uh, as long as other greenhouse gases like uh, carbon dioxide, for example. But uh, while it's up there, it traps a lot more heat um, during its lifetime. Um, so about 30 to 40% of global methane emissions as anthropogenic global uh, Methane emissions uh, are attributed to livestock and mainly ruminants. Uh, because methane breaks down in, in about 10 to 12 years, uh, if you can reduce emissions now, what it means is that we can see the benefits of the, um, uh, for the climate within a, a single generation. So it's, the, the benefits are in, in the near term. So that's why it's such a critical target uh, and addressing methane really uh, buys us valuable time while we work on the long-term carbon solutions. Wisenetics turns podcast airtime into brand authority. We don't sell ads, we elevate voices. Curious how far your voice can go to become a reference in the industry and attract more leads? Scan the QR code and discover how we can turn your expertise into unmatched brand authority. Let's transform expertise into influence, starting now. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so given that then, what are some methane in inhibitors and feed additives and how do they work inside the cow's stomach? Yeah, so cows produce um, methane as part of their natural uh, digestion process. They, uh, they, that's one of the reasons they're able to take in uh, high fiber uh, diets and grasses and uh, straw and you know, uh, byproducts and all that that uh, people cannot consume. Uh, ruminants can take that and, and they can, um, with the help of microbes, they can break it down into valuable energy uh, for themselves. Uh, but the microbes in the rumen, um, they also work with others because some of the fermentation processes is hydrogen and that hydrogen need to be, um, uh, it, 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 they need to get rid of the hydrogen. And the way they do that is they work with other microbes, particularly um, methanogens, and, and, uh, and that way, the hydrogen is being um, used by, by the microbes to grow. And then there's a byproduct from those methanogens, uh, which is methane. Um, so methane inhibitors or other feed additives, then they target those microbes. Essentially, they block the, the steps where methane would normally be produced if they're inhibitors. Um, 
you know, so some compounds work by the inhibiting specific enzymes that metanogens need in order to form methane. Uh, and what's exciting is is that uh, you don't really have to give them in high doses. You can give them very small doses, uh, which are not harmful to animals, and they don't affect the nutritional quality of uh, of the diet of the uh, milk and, and meat. Uh, so they allow us to cut greenhouse gas without sacrificing animal health or uh, productivity. So, and uh, feed additives, other feed additives, they also work by changing the rumen environment so that there's not enough hydrogen or they compete with the hydrogen so that there's less hydrogen available, which means that there's less methane uh, coming from that as well. So you can see sort of two ways working, one inhibitor directly affecting the methanogens and the other way, um, other additives that would modify the rumen environment so that there is less methane coming from the, from the rumen. So I'm no expert in this field at all, but I've been lucky enough to be on a graduate committee with a student who is actually researching some seaweed additives. And so from what I understand, seaweed and 3NOP are often highlighted. Um, there's probably others that, as far as the additive space and inhibitor space. But what makes these different from other feed-based approaches? Uh, yeah, so seaweed and, and 3NOP, they're both uh, methane inhibitors. Uh, seaweed, particularly asparagopsis, it contains a natural compound called bromophore which is extremely effective at shutting down methane from uh, for methane formation in, in, in the rumen. Uh, even at really low doses, uh, very low levels, it can achieve uh, quite, quite large reductions. And, and we've done this work um, in Davis and also th th throughout the world. And what we've seen is that uh, small amounts would, uh, uh, would reduce methane emissions quite substantially um, uh, w w when they are given in, in a way that the animals can consume. So bromoform is a volatile compound, So if it, but in seaweed, it's kind of integrated within the cells so that it's available to the animals. So once they consume it, it starts to break down. It lives in the, uh, in the uh, rumen uh, very short uh, amount of time. So it breaks down very quickly, it's released, and then the metabolites of the, uh, of the bromoform are stay maybe a, few, uh, a couple of days there. But they uh, usually very quickly is metabolized, and, and then um, the, the impact is that it reduces met, uh, methane emissions. Similarly, 3NOP um, also it's a, it's a synthetic compound that targets the same methane forming pathway, uh, and very consistent results across many many studies. It's probably the most studied um, additive out there. It's probably 70, 80 uh, papers that, that, that describe the, uh, the reduction potential of uh, so compared with other approaches like you know adding oils and fats and and, and tannins, those two um, at the moment stand out because they are more potent and reliable at reducing emissions without having a major trade-off for uh, animal performance. Uh, so each each has challenges, of course. You know scaling seaweed production and ensuring affordability for farmers, uh, regulatory approval, um, and supply chains for three NOP uh, might be. A bit of a challenge right now, but their potential is really um, unmatched right now. And we've seen many, many studies that would confirm the the, the potential for for both of those uh, uh, feed additives. Okay, so if we get into the specifics a bit, what have your research or other folks' research shown in terms of, in terms of the actual reduction of methane, and then ultimately, what does that mean for farmers in practice? Yeah, uh, so we started working on this, uh, particularly for, three, for uh, uh, seaweed in 2018. And, and the first work we've done in dairy, uh, that was, uh, we saw about 60% reduction uh, in emissions. Uh, but we were using a sort of a different type of um, seaweed, Asparagopsis um, armata, which is similar to the, the other one, but more effective is uh, taxiformis, so asparagus taxiformis. And when we switched to a taxiformis and we did it in, in beef cattle, we saw a reduction of up to 80%. Um, and then we looked at it uh, in a different formulation. So we're using powder. And when we change powder into pellets, so that we want to use it for grazing situations, uh, and we saw about, on average, about 40% uh, reduction. This is, you know, in a pasture setting up in Montana. Um, and what we saw was that if the animal actually are consuming it, then the reduction is, is quite substantial. Um, so some animals are okay. They were happy to consume it. And some animals were not too sure. So that's why, on average, we have about 40%. And so, so some of the things have changed a little bit. And now the, the, there are... 
uh, asparagopsis that you can use in oil format. So in oil, it makes it a lot easier. Uh, you can combine it uh, fairly uh, easily and the animals don't have to taste it at all. They, they don't know it's there. Um, we've done some work, not seaweed, but uh, bromoform-based synthetic compounds. So it basically acts exactly as, uh, as seaweed. And what we've, seen, what we've seen there was a reduction up to 90%, more than 90% reduction in, in emissions. And uh, we haven't seen any, uh, any kind of um, effect in terms of the, the growth. This is in beef cattle uh, growth or, 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 or any other uh, metric. So um, keeping the same level of productivity, uh, who knows, maybe even better, um, uh, then we see quite a quite substantial reduction in emissions. So for farmers, this means that there is a practical way to make a big climate impact without undermining productivity. And we hope it actually increases uh, productivity. We need to do more work for a longer period of time with more animals to be able to say definit definitively that there is a, a productivity gain here as well. Um, and so we hope that it will actually become an, an economic uh, opportunity. And if carbon markets or, or incentives are structured so that farmers benefit from their contribution, then to, to climate mitigation, that becomes even more attractive. So I, I think you've kind of already touched on this um, question I was going to ask, which is looking ahead, how do you see these methane inhibitors and other innovations shaping the future of sustainable livestock production? But as an addition to that, I'm just curious, if we kind of take a step back, this innovation in and of itself, how did this even come about? Like, how did people decide to focus on seaweed, bromoform, 3NOP as an inv innovation in and of itself that, you know, might be, I guess, uh, indicator of how the next innovation comes about? Uh, yeah, so um, maybe I'll go with the history first and and then talk about sort of the, the, the future. Um, so with the seaweed, it kind of started um, from farmers observing uh, cattle in, in Canada, in eastern Canada, when they were consuming seaweed, they seemed to to do well. So it was really about the health of the uh, of the animals. But the researcher who was who was there, uh, Rob Kinley, then to, went to Australia. For, he changed jobs to, to Australia and 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 then started looking into the seaweed that were available in uh, at the coast of Australia. And uh, through that, they, they were able to identify one species, Asparagopsis taxiformis, to be very, very effective for, for, for methane mitigation. And this was done in vitro. And, and then when we saw the results, uh, we um, contacted them and we, we asked for samples. They sent us samples and we did the same thing in, in vitro also in, here at UC Davis. And we were able to replicate the, the results and we got even more interested to do it in, in vivo. And, and then uh, they sent us a, a larger amount of uh, material. And so we were able to uh, conduct uh, a couple of experiments here that showed quite a, a big reduction. And then for 3 NP, it was um, a, a chemist in, in DSM in Germany, Switzerland, where they were really looking into you know, what, are the, what are the enzymes that are responsible for methanogenesis and then and how do we... Uh, try to inhibit those uh, those enzymes, and that's uh, that's how the work started. Probably 10, 15 years ago, we're trying different types of uh, additives to see if there is an, an inhibitor uh, uh, effect. And then I think finally by 2014, 15, uh, they were able to identify those molecules that were able to to, to do that. Um, so that's how it kind of started. And then there's a lot of uh, uh, experiments that were done uh, over the last um, about uh, five to ten years and a body of science accumulated to, to show that those are really a consistent uh, uh, reduction. So uh, in the future, I mean, I see methane inhibitors as part of the larger toolbox. You know, there's no single solution that will solve everything. But when combined with genetics, you know, the identifying animals that have inherently low methane emissions using better manure management, uh, precision feeding, uh, making sure that you're feeding exactly what the animals is needed. All of that, you know, can make livestock systems a lot more su sustainable. So, in the near future, I think uh, additives like 3 p which is now approved in 60 countries, maybe more, including the U.S., Canada, and the European Union, and others, um, would be very important. I think um, seaweed probably will be. Uh, approved as well. It's already been used in Australia. There's no need for uh, approval there. So this has been commercially 
uh, available in, in, in Australia, then uh, I think it will be available at scale in the near future as well. And in the long term, you know, we may see even more innovative approaches like vaccines. You know, the, the vaccines have shown about 20% reduction. Uh, we are working uh, with uh, gene editing. We're using CRISPR to edit the genes of uh, microbes, and that might get us uh, closer to 100% reduction. So, well, we're, th 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 all of these things are, are coming in the next five to, to 10 years will have those uh, innovations uh, coming out. So the bottom line is that, you know, we don't have to choose between producing food and protecting the planet. We can do both if we, if we use science wisely. That's awesome. One last question, given that this is the Dairy Health Podcast and given what you just said about the Canadian farmers that sort of explored this early on, I, mean, I am curious as far as how the seaweed additive, the additional possibilities for other, you know, inhibitors across the board can impact or sustain health as well in the dairy cow or, or beef cattle for that matter. Yeah, so I mean, there is uh, some evidence, uh, not very strong evidence, but there's some evidence that uh, actually, uh, what I could see, it will help with the immunity of, uh, of animals. Uh, so we really need to investigate that uh, that aspect and how it plays a role in uh, in improving the the health status of, of animals as well. So we really have to look into. Um, the health and, and reproduction and you know uh, we don't want to have any unintended consequences when we are using feed additives but uh, uh, maybe in combination with others I think there's opportunity to improve uh, animal health as well. That's really fascinating. Awesome. Hey, thanks so much for taking the time to do this. I, I know you're a busy person and um, that you're an expert in this field and you've got other people calling, I'm sure. So I really do appreciate you taking the time to speak to us. Uh, it's my pleasure. It's, you know, it's my favorite subject. So. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. All right. With that, we'll wrap it up then. Thank you. All right. Thank you.